100 days in Minecraft in a nuclear wasteland on hardcore. It's a harsh radioactive summer in the ruins of a decaying city filled with dangerous natural disasters, acid rain, burning hot summer days, and of course, highly radioactive wastelands overrun with new mutant monsters. This mod pack heavily revolves around Nuclearcraft. Nuclearcraft is an in-depth end-game add-on mod pack to Minecraft. It lets you mine radioactive elements, build cool industrial machines, nuclear reactors, and of course, nuclear weapons. Every 10 days, I'll be adding a new mod or a new disaster to keep things, well, honestly, a little bit crazy. All of these things are going to be going against us while we try to build up a doomsday bunker with summer crops and nuclear industry. You don't need to subscribe. You don't need to like this video. But you 100% need to stay and watch the whole video, especially the natural disaster on day 60 and the crazy man-made disaster on day 90. Uh, that one was... Yeah, I feel a little bit dumb. But I guess you'll get to see that for yourself. So welcome to... Summy Summer Nuki. Yeah, that sounds good. Ah, the wasteland. It's been almost a full year since the bombs fell, and some areas, like this one, are actually starting to recover. These bushes give you Pam's Harvest Craft crops. Each crop has specific growing seasons, and since this entire playthrough is summer, I want to save all of my summer crops so I can plant them later. I came across my first city, but they can be pretty dangerous, so I'm going to stay away for now. This sheep, however, mm, not so dangerous, so I take my anger out on them instead. Sorry, little buddy. I'm going to start these 100 days by looking for a really good area to build in. I spend all day, but it's starting to get a bit late, so I make some basic wooden tools and then a bed from all that wool, and then I find a spot in the hillside next to the river where I can dig my first little hobbit hole. Block up the entrance, for safety. Place my bed. Promise I didn't cry, because, you know, I'm not scared of the dark. Nope, d definitely not scared. So we fumble our way around in the dark, and finally, break out. And early in the next morning, I find this open plain biome, which looks good for a base. I see that there's a swamp biome right next door, which is perfect, and I decide I'm going to settle right here. So. I start building the bunker. This is a quick start here, just to stay safe for now. And I see this ravine next door, which makes this place even better. But before I start mining, I want to get some storage set up and throw all my crops in there. So back at the ravine, I start my descent. This first little mining session, I'm mostly just trying to find iron to get a good start with tools. If you've seen any of my previous videos before, you know that I love me some farming, and Pam's Harvest Craft adds a whole new level to farming. And while I'm down here, I find this new block. Marble. That might be useful later. <clears throat> Hint. We head back home for the night, and set up the base just a little bit more. This includes some furnaces for our iron, and soon, the other new ores of this mod pack. I see this little bird, but as soon as he smells me, he decides he'd rather be out in the rain, which is fair. I then make my pants first, as always. I'm gonna need them. They're gonna keep me safe from this hoe. Now, let's get into the first big mod, my favorite mod, Pam's Harvest Craft. Pam's Harvest Craft has 129 different crops, which are used to make over 54 different recipes, which give you a ton of hunger and even some cool buffs. Now remember, this entire playthrough will be in the summer, so I can only plant summer crops out in the open. Each biome has different bushes, or wild gardens, like these, which give a different set of crops. I'm planting some bell peppers here, and also I'm looking for that, rice from the swamp. I started setting up the beginning of the farm, when a hungry zombie comes by. I offer to share my crops, but he's looking for something called brains, and that must be one of those keto diet things. Oh well, never heard of it, sorry. I get the rest of the rice planted, and some armor for the next wave of hungry boys. On day four, I decide to jump down into this ravine, because I like giving my viewers a small heart attack. I managed to find a decent cave full of the modded ores, which I will need, 
but I'm not going to want to worry about just yet. Instead, I'm going to try to get down to Y11 as soon as I can and grab some diamonds. I know that day 10, there's going to be a crazy challenge waiting for us. Speaking of challenge, I find this boss spawner and I decide to take the fight. Oh, great. Cave spiders and a witch. Poison is way too OP in Minecraft. Every time I have to deal with it, I normally just end up running and hiding to heal. But I do manage to slap the witch around a little bit and climb the waterfall out of the ravine. Back at home, I get some bricks cooked up, which are important for harvest craft. I make some bakeware and then this diamond, really big butter knife. Can you make a diamond fork and spoon? Anyway, I'm still trying to get all of my tomatoes set up on day five. And then I decide, what the heck? Does radiation sickness never hurt anybody? Right? Don't Google that. I'm grabbing this ore anyway. Thorium, a radioactive element and a big part of nuclear craft. You guys probably noticed the bar down at the bottom left part of my hub with the yellow numbers. Notice how they went to 700 plus nano rads from Pico rads. That's because I am holding a slightly radioactive element. Nano rads aren't really a big deal, just something to keep an eye on for now. What is a big deal is getting this pot made so we can make our very first harvest craft recipe. Green tea. The best kind of tea? Fight me, England. Another dramatic jump on day six, and we're back to the mine. For now, I'm just focusing on grabbing some thorium and this bad boy, uranium. Notice how my rad meter has now gone to the U-rads, which are called micro-rads, which is still pretty safe, but I don't want to hold on to too much uranium for too long. It's nothing to worry about. However, the storm might be something to worry about. It's still far off for now, but after a bit more mining, I can hear it's right overhead. I decide to run back up the waterfall, check my base, and make sure it's safe. Luckily, everything is underground, so it doesn't look like anything happened. I will, however, drop off all my radioactive elements into the furnaces and add a couple more furnaces because now we have a ton of different ores to deal with. You know, all this radiation exposure is starting to get me a little bit hungry. So it's a good thing that on day seven, we have a lot of our crops growing. Yay! Now I picked these specific crops because they all grow in the summer and they can be added together to make a pretty solid recipe. Bell peppers, tomatoes, and some rice. And they make stuffed bell peppers, a perfect summer meal that goes with my green tea. And now that we're all nice and fed, it's time to get some radiation sickness and throw it all up again. The most important thing in nuclear craft is power. And the first step of getting power is a decay generator. It makes power for your machines, but it can be built out of vanilla Minecraft items, so it can be your very first power source. But at the same time, it's very inefficient. So in order to get any power out of it, we need a ton of uranium and thorium. So we're gonna go out and find another ravine tonight. And I start heading home to safety. On the way home, I see this Aurora, which temporarily distracts me from the fact that my life is a nightmare. We keep a close eye on our ores, and by day eight, we've already run out of food. Nice. So now I have no choice but to start another farm. Now look guys, I'm not doing this because I want to. I mean, I, I have to farm, I ran out of food. The farmer life chose me, I swear. Finally, we have enough thorium ingots to make our thorium block. I make a little room in the back of the bunker and I start to add my industrial pieces. You just place the block and then you make your decay generator touching the radioactive blocks and it will slowly leach power from the block. And then I search the thing that I'm attracted to, which is man you factories, and start building the components for one. This includes some gravel that I need to go find, a copper solenoid, a piston, or lead. That's pretty simple. We then place the manufactory so that it is touching one of the sides of the generator, and it will start to get power. Very, very slowly get power. One of the basic components for almost every machine is graphite which is made by putting coal into the manufactory. First, you get crushed coal. Then, you get tired from waiting, then you fall asleep. The next step is you wake up to a horde of irradiated undead. And trust me, all part of the process. 
Albert Einstein had to do the exact same thing before he invented physics. That's a fact. Speaking of part of the process, a huge part of nuclear craft is mining up all the resources you need for your machines. It adds a lot of mining and, well, a lot of crafting, so if you like mining and crafting in Minecraft, welcome to nuclear craft. In the meantime, though, here's me getting a speed boost from drinking my green tea, and I'm getting the zoomies. Whee! I've got a great start, and I'm feeling like I have everything here under control. Oh no, it's day 10. Why did I say that out loud? I take it back, I take it back. Oh, come on. Of course, just as I start feeling good, now this. The radiation has shot up from three micro rads to 186 micro rads. If I don't find some way to protect myself from the radiation, this could become a problem. But first, I want to test something. The radiation normally is only on the topsoil, and you can avoid a lot of it by heading underground. Sure enough, by going down deeper, the radiation is only a quarter as strong. But at the same time, I can hear another storm coming. Great. Staying down here might keep me safe from the rats, but eventually I'm going to have to go to the surface and get food. Oh no, the crops. All of my carefully picked crops are now ruined, and the radiation buffs the mobs. This means the nuclear storm will make being out on the surface way too dangerous in the day and in the night. I barely managed to get away from the horde this night and make it to day 11. I want to be safe. I need to go deeper and get away from all these surface rats. I don't have a choice. But if I'm going to have to move my base anyways, I might as well find some extra shelter from the mobs. If I move into the city, I could board up the windows and stop the mobs from just pouring down into my bunker. And this building right here looks perfect. So I run in here, I start throwing down all the torches. And it looks like I'm going to have to hurry too because night is already coming. I decide that the city is still a little too dangerous without some better defenses, so I run back to my first bunker and sleep for the night. Day 12 and I check out the machines and they're still working, so we take out the cobble blocking the opening, but this storm has wrecked the whole area. All the grass and all the trees have been ripped up. And then I finally get up to the building and I see, wait, is this pile of leaves out front blocking the front door? Huh. Look at that, now I don't have to break a window every time I want to come in. Then we start digging. I head down about 20 blocks, and then I make a 90 degree turn to the left, and then another 20 blocks. Basically, I'm making a massive square staircase. We break down into a chamber right above Y11, and I'm gonna try to see if this place could work as a new, safer, stronger base. It honestly looks pretty good, and I'm sure I could use this, but I could find a bigger, better ravine to build in. Okay, looks like the zombies have massed up top. Now I'm running back into the base. And with barely any food, I'm forced to block myself in and, well, I guess we're gonna be calling this place home after all. Speaking of run out of food, I did manage to bring some dirt, so I can get started on a bunker farm. And, you know, try not to starve, maybe, I used to build underground bases with my viewers over on Twitch all the time. And this right here, it's really bringing back some memories. I love underground builds. We place our very first piece of polished marble in the base. And then we place a, a second and a third and a fourth. You get it. We start placing down our marble. I then start my very first plant in the bunker, tea leaves, because that's really the only thing I managed to get out of the old base before I got stuck down here. I start looking around for a good area to place some storage, but since I'm going to need to move all of my stuff eventually, I decide why not make myself a storage room. Now normally, I'm not a big fan of storage rooms. They look good in builds and make things more organized, but the truth is you should really have your storage next to your crafting area. So even though I am going to be making this a storage room, I'm just doing it for the looks, really. Later, when I figure out where my industry is going, I'll probably put some more storage there. I take a little break and I throw a bed in the cave, then I get back to work. Now I have a decent amount of storage, and I'm in no rush to finish this room. As I work, I hear another storm pass up above, and it makes me a little bit more reassured that I'm building so far down here. I have less rads and no nuclear superstorms. 
I'm looking at my farm, and I'm glad that this one is going to be safe. Speaking of farm, it does look like we have some time to add a little more farmland. Remember, with Pam's harvest craft, it's going to take a lot of crops to keep us fed. Plus, I mean, the more we build underground, the more we mine, so it's basically a two-in-one. The only problem with building in caves is that there's a bunch of little pockets and hidden areas that I don't really know about that well, so zombies can spawn and they can find us. So while we're down here, we do need to stay on our guard. On the morning of day 15, I haven't finished my farm and we just had our last bell pepper, so I kinda need to hurry up here. We get the marble set to border the farm, we get the dirt all laid out, and finally, we add our middle overhead light, as well as getting torches set all around the farm. All we need now are some crops. So we break out of the bunker, and we go out to find the base and see what we left there. The radiation and the storms are still looking pretty bad out here, so we're going to need to hurry. First, we're going to grab the most expensive and time-consuming parts. The machines and nuclear craft can easily be picked up, and you don't need silk touch. They don't take any damage. We finally get some graphite too, which is good. Then we salvage the furnaces as well. Finally, I go to grab the crops, but this might take another trip. The rads are still 150 plus, and the zombies never give up. So I'm gonna book it home. Also, I grabbed some water while I was up there, and I'm gonna set up an infinite water source right now. Next, on top of the subsidian, we set up our final spot for the machines. We get two decay generators around our manufactory, but wow, even both of those, it's just such little power. We really need to upgrade our power sources. The next step in nuclear craft is building an alloy furnace. This will help us make materials for better machines, but also help us get better resources like tough alloy, which is just as strong as diamonds for armor and tools. We'll also place our furnaces here on the back wall. I just want to remind them that they're lower class and they're not as beloved as the other new machines. Next, we start working on the farms, because that's the reason we left the surface anyways, and throw down the tomatoes. Day 16, and things are starting to take shape, but we are missing one big thing. So we're gonna need to make a second trip. It's daytime and it's safe. So we easily managed to get back to our first base, but just like I was worried, there are no bell peppers. We drink some tea, which is our only source of food at this point, and we head through these ruined wasteland. The storm flattened a lot of stuff, but if we go far enough away and look hard enough, we can still find a few of these bushes. And in those bushes, we find our radioactive spicy bell peppers. Look, if I can survive standing right next to some uranium blocks, I can handle some glowing bell peppers. So we get these growing, but until I have enough to replant them, I'm gonna have to just stick to a diet of green tea and uncooked rice. Yum. I love Asian food, but this isn't really what I had in mind. Next, we combine our lead with our graphite dust and we make a basic panel. These are useful for a ton of nuclear craft designs. We make a regular furnace, add the panels, and a couple of basic other components, and boom, we get our very first alloy furnace. So now we're gonna try to rush some tough alloy, which requires lithium and ferro-boron, which is boron and steel. And steel is iron and coal. Do you see how this works? This is nuclear craft in a nutshell. We don't have much coal, so that'll be the first thing we Oh, there's like literally coal right on the roof. That's kind of nice. We do have some uranium and thorium to use. So we get these blocks set up, touching our decay generators, and our machines will now be just a little bit faster. But this is still gonna take a ton of time. So I'm gonna start work on the next resource we need. Can you guys guess what I'm doing here? Huh? Come on. I'm putting down rows of dirt. Now you guys know this. We're still waiting on our machines, but this lack of power that makes me feel more like a caveman than a nuclear physicist. I do grab some dirt from under the storage room in the meantime. Okay, come on. Rows of dirt, water in the middle. It's obvious. Also, it needs light overhead, so it's probably a plant, right? Huh? Come on, guys. 
Back at the machines, we finally have our very first steel, but we still need a lot of coal. I decided I'm gonna cannibalize some of the coal out of the furnaces and use it to keep the alloy production going. I also make the lights look a little bit nicer. And if you didn't guess by this time we were doing sugarcane, then come on, you guys aren't paying attention. We get a bit more steel and we set up our last coal in there. And that should be the end of today. Day 18, and we're getting a bit of base expanding done, which is good because it also helps me get some more coal. And I'm more thirsty for coal than Twitch thoughts are thirsty for subs. Now we're getting the storage room set up and I want it to be all marbled out. But while I do like how this is looking, I realize that I need to put some focus onto my machines or we'll never get that tough alloy. So I run deep into this cave and I start mining up some ores with my focus, of course, being on getting that coal. While we hit some thorium, I hear the storms still raging above. And I begin to realize that now that I'm safe down here, that sound just doesn't bug me anymore. I eventually dig my way all the way back into the bunker, so I decide to go and get some sleep. And then when I wake up hungry and cranky, I realize it's time to make some real food. I run to my farm to get some crops, but I'm still trying to balance what I should eat and what I should replant. In the end, I can only get a handful of stuffed bell peppers, but that should definitely help me in the mines. And the storage room is coming along and I finally decide it's time to push ahead and turn our steel into ferro boron. So we throw our steel back into the alloy furnace with the boron we've been mining and in no time, we get our very first ferro boron ingot. But I also make sure to grab some more tomatoes. By now, we have a good amount of food ready, which is good because we're gonna need it for the day 20 event. I also try something that I've never done before. This is important. I put the thorium ore into the manufactory. In theory, one ore in the manufactory should turn into two thorium. Oh, yeah, and it does. Now, if we put the dust into the furnace, it should make one ingot per dust. And that means, ah, uh, yes, yes. So now, effectively, I can double my ore production by processing raw ores through the manufacturing first. And on top of that, we finally start to get some tough alloy. Perfect. This is really starting to ramp up. Oh yeah, it's all coming together now. Tough alloy is a super useful mid-game nuclear craft item. First thing I make with my tough alloy is a pick. And now, if you're wondering, is it as good as a diamond pick? Well, let's go find out. And boom, it can mine obsidian. And it has just as much durability as a diamond pick. But hey, if you still love diamonds, don't worry. You can always make diamonds with nuclear craft machines. It only takes 64 coal, which is not too bad. We make a tough alloy chest plate, which again, has the exact same protection as diamond. And we can even upgrade it with radiation shielding. And if you look down at my rad meter, it's starting to look like we might just need to do that. We finish the day by getting the storage room fully done. Hmm, wonder what's gonna happen tomorrow. By day 20, we have smelted up enough tough alloy for some pants and a helmet and now we have full armor. Even though I've already made a diamond sword, I make a tough alloy one because I just like the look of it. I even get myself a tough alloy axe. Now I'm gonna head up to the surface and use that axe to grab some wood. Luckily, it's daytime. That means no mobs. And I'm looking at, oh, 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 what? Oh, of course. The hot summer days and the weakened ozone. This means the sun is so hot. It burns us if we walk out into it. Standing out in direct sunlight now has the exact same effects as standing in lava. Oh, I go out the back just to test to see if it's true. Yeah, well, so much for going outside, I guess. So, the very first thing I'm looking up is solar cape and a solar helmet. And this isn't too hard to craft. It just takes a lot of string and a lot of sugarcane. Until I make that protection, I cannot go outside in the daytime. So I'm gonna make myself a clock so I can figure out when it's nighttime. As soon as my clock says it's night, I run upstairs and I grab a ton of wood. 
along with grabbing some saplings. Also, while I'm out here, I grab some dirt too. But I need to hurry, because the sun is rising. If I do decide to go out at night, I need to make sure that I get home before daybreak. This has basically turned me into a zombie. Day 21, and I immediately get started on my next project. And I'm setting up another patch of dirt. I also break open a huge area above the bunker because I am going to need a lot of top room. If I can't go out and harvest trees from the surface, I guess I'll just have to grow my own trees. I break open this big area because I know that trees can be kind of finicky when it comes to if they have enough room to grow. But with just a little bone meal, ta-da, our own underground orchard. Trees really aren't supposed to grow down at Y11. Don't tell me that. I do throw down a few more so that we'll never be short of wood again. And at the end of day 22, I feel pretty good about what we got going on here. Now on day 23, I've decided I don't want to just be stuck down here and only able to go out at night. I start working on the next project to help me stay safe on the surface. But we do hear a storm, which reminds me of just how dangerous it is. So much for boarding up the windows. But we do manage to get a third farm down. This one is completely dedicated to growing string crops. Yeah, Harvest Craft has crops that can make things like string and wool. For example, cotton. It's a smart idea for a mod, right? That night I peek outside and I see that the whole building and the landscape have totally been ripped up. But this is nothing compared to what's coming on day 60. But the real reason I came out here was to mine the marble from the old base. I kind of lost track of time. Now it's daytime, and I'm stuck in the fiery sun. The zombies take advantage, and they attack me, and I'm forced to go out into the sun. Look at this. The tables have really turned. The zombies are the ones that are fine in the sun, and I'm the one who can't survive out here. I drink my speed boost tea, and I make a blind run for it. The trick is, I have to hop from water source to water source and make sure I'm healing all the way. It's dangerous because the sun also blinds me, and if I get lost, I'll burn up quick. I get to the cover of this last tree, but without a water bucket, I have to just sit here and take the pain. This is a dangerous mod. I am already hating it. One final sprint to the bunker, and... and... Oof. I calculated the risk, but man, am I bad at math. Now we can add on some useless marble. That's only really good for looks, so that was totally worth. We do get the back wall of the storage room and the roof done as well, so I guess it does look pretty good. Finally, we chop down and replant our trees, and then I start to set up the lights for our cotton farm. After that, I call it a night. Sleeping with sunburns hurts. Day 25, a quarter of the way in, and I decide it's time to get some radaway production going. I can see that my rads are starting to climb up, and they might start to make me sick by day 100. I add another generator, and then I see to make a melter, we need nether brick. So I get all of the components ready, and then mine up some of our obsidian, and set the portal right under the stairs. Before I head in though, I want to get a ton of food stacked. And also, I want to set up a little bit more of the sugarcane so it can grow while we're away. I get a full stack of stuffed peppers and a full stack of tea, so I'm ready to go in. Day 26, I get the portal lit, and I jump in. Now I know what you're thinking. Nether brick. So easy. You just mine the ground. Well, I spun in a nether made out of flesh. Yeah, see all those blocks under me? They're actually flesh blocks. Like, for a hundred blocks out. Ew. I do get some of these glowing mushrooms, and uh, I will need those. They're going to come in handy. And finally, I make it all the way to some nether block. So with that, we can get our melter. Hot and spicy indeed. I start breaking open another area for a fourth farm, because I want to get some agave going for sugar, but you'll see how that ends up going. But hey, an extra farm is always worth the time. Now we keep working the sugar cane, we keep working the cotton, and by working, I mean power growing. And soon we have enough cotton to turn into string and the string into wool. Now we can make all of those items that go into the solar protection hood. Now I have my face looking nice and sexy and 
Now I'm going to go up top, just as the sun is setting, to see if this does protect us at all. And... Oh! Hey! Look! Nope. Nope, 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 nope. I was tricked. I was bamboozled. Hoodwinked, even. So it turns out we still need to get the cape at the same time. So I'm going to be mining while we wait. But I get tired of waiting and harvest the small shirt king. Then I get tired some more. I can't believe how much I hate the angry sunlight. Finally, by day 28, we have our solar cape finished. Will this better work? Let's see if this was all worth it. Put on both the helmet and the cape. Hey, all right. All right, now we can go out in the sun without burning alive. This is great. It took me eight days to deal with this event, and the next event is only two days away. Anywho, I spend this time out in the sun getting some books, as well as an enchantment table and an anvil. Just to be safe, I put a couple more torches everywhere, try to keep the zombies away, and then I head to bed. The next day, I head out trying to look for a desert biome to find that agave. And now, I finally get to see just how ruined this land is. I end up traveling all day, and soon, I see that my cape and helmet are actually starting to take some damage. They won't last very long out in the sun, that's understandable. So now that I'm going to be going outside a lot more, I decide to make a staircase. After all, I've conquered the wasteland day and night, and now I can easily- Oh wait, 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 it's day 30. I didn't mean to trash talk, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, you knew that was going to happen. The radiation spiked to 30 millirads, an extremely hazardous level of radiation. And it only climbs higher the closer to the surface we get. Not only are we going to have to go back to avoiding the surface, but now we need to find an answer to the biggest crisis yet. The answer, the only answer, is Radaway. I totally wasn't focused on making it, and now it's kind of too late. Radaway needs Radaway fluid, which is ethanol, okay, which needs molten sugar and water inside of a chemical reactor. So like a ton of work and a ton of time is going to be needed and my rad meter is skyrocketing. So now the sugar is in the melter. So now I'm trying to throw together all the components of the chemical reactor. We need to use this gold to make an electric motor. It's our last bit of gold. So hopefully, no other machines are going to need it. We get this chassis built, and we just need some glow dust. So we make a quick trip to the nether. We then carefully, carefully grab a little bit of glowstone dust. We come back. Okay. We make the servo mechanism. Good. And now we have the chemical reactor. And the rad meter is just about a quarter of the way. <sighs> Never mind that. Just focus. Water? Check. Molten sugar? Check. Power? Finally. Check. The next machine is a fluid enricher. It needs some more steel. Mm. Oh, this might be bad. Uh, okay, I get some wood for a hopper. And now the rad meter is starting. Uh, focus. Focus. We get the steel. And now, we get the Enricher. It's just in time. I'm starting to get radiation sickness. Look, weakness, mining fatigue. Not good. Okay, the Enricher, we need ethanol. And quickly, we get those glowing mushrooms before. That might have just given us enough time to save us. It takes a while, but we do get our last machine. The fluid infused... No. Oh, no, 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 no. Ugh! We need gold! I don't have any gold, I just used it. Ugh, I can't go mining with this fatigue either. Oh my god, and look at my meter. Okay, okay, okay. We just need to mine. This is our last option. No matter what happens, we're gonna go down fighting. No matter what. The mining fatigue makes this really hard. Okay, an open chamber. And look, a fortress. It's flooded with zombies. And the weakness means I can't fight them traditionally. I need to get a little bit creative and break the blocks under them to make them fall. I get inside, chess. But oh, this could be, yes, 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 yes. Okay, 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 okay. That's it, we're gone, we're out of here. We're running on our way back. We're starting to redline. I've never had my rads this high without Radaway. 
Okay. Just a bit more. Infuser is down. Okay. Let's grab the Rataway fluid. Good. We combined it with bioplastic that we've made from the manufactory. I'm even getting hunger from the rad sickness. I can't even keep my food down. Yes, the first... Okay. First Rataway. I hook up the IV and relief. Even if it's just a little bit. Relief. But now, I'm going to have to start using Rataway the same way I use food. I need to make sure that I always have a solid production of it. That means I need to keep a close eye on every machine, every step of the way of the production, and get everything that it needs. Soon, I see that one of those needs are more power, of course. The problem is that if I use more radioactive elements to make more power, I'll die quicker from the radiation, so I really need to be careful. It's time for the next level of nuclear craft. I don't want to fill my bunker with a bunch of radioactive elements, but I really have no choice. The next power source upgrade is the usage of RTGs. An RTG is a machine that is made out of some basic components in a block of uranium-238. That's an isotope of uranium that is decayed down from a uranium block that we're already using for our decay generators. Okay, there. We have our RTG. We put that next to the manufactory. Now we have power, but it's still really limited. And we're going to need more power, but I don't want a nuclear reactor. I just need to make this work somehow, for now. Okay, the bioplastic is made, and now we can run it into the infuser. The next thing that's slowing us down in the rad fluid production is glowing mushrooms. So I'm going to clear out some of the trees for now and make some room to place down a brown mushroom. Luckily, I made a ton of room for the trees, which can now be used for this mushroom. So I use a bit of bone meal, and nice. It just barely fits, but it fits. So we can cut this down for more mushrooms. Then we add some glow dust, and we get glowing mushrooms, which then we add to the enricher. Good. Okay. The enricher also needs more methane, but that's easy. I hope. Now I have a few more packs of Rataway, and I should be safe. So it's time to start mining again. I mine all night into day 34, because I really need to start getting some uranium and working on better power sources. Find some thorium as well, and I still need to use decay generators for just a little bit longer. So I place them on the manufactory to keep the bioplastic production going. Okay. The last four days were a little bit crazy, but we did it. For the time being, we're still thriving. So now that we are a bit more stabilized and I've dried all the pee out of my pants, I think it's time to add on the next room, an enchantment room. So I'm digging the space out for that when I find a huge vein of gold. Great. Wish I knew about this two days ago when I was freaking out. <sighs> we get the room set up. And it's pretty small. But remember, this is a doomsday bunker, not a Four Seasons Hotel, guys. We get all the bookshelves set up as well. Now we can get enchants all the way up to level 30. And I start getting some enchants on all of my alloy gear. I then throw up a ceiling. I gotta be honest, it's kind of nice to be working on a project that isn't life or death. We go out mining, and we do find some diamonds, which are always nice, even if they are a little obsolete now. And of course, we grab as much coal as we can get our smelly little hands on. Now we have radiation poisoning and the black lung. And as always, I'm always keeping my mushroom production going. Looks like we really gotta bone those shrooms. Hey boys. That means some time in the nether too. And all that mining has got us a good chunk of uranium, so we set those blocks up. On day 36, I decide I don't want to sleep in a cave anymore. We're almost more than a third of the way done with this playthrough, and I'm still basically sleeping on the dirt. I start out by digging a lowered pit and making the ceiling checkered, like my past. I then start out on a big mining trip, and I'm out to find as many nuclear craft ores as I possibly can. I went through large caves, I went through small caves, I went through lava, and I went through water. I climbed up high, and I dug down low. I fought through dangerous dungeon, and you guys, you guys get the point. I was mining for like two full days. I got a good haul of uranium. In fact, I got so much, I had to make a second manufactory for the thorium. And soon, my base, and my lungs, and my heart 
were full of radioactive dust. The decay generators are working fine for now, and soon their uranium blocks will decay and we can use those to make more RTGs. Finally, almost 10 days after the spike in radiation levels, the surface is a little bit safer. So I have my Rataway and my sun protection, and things are starting to look... Oh, 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 no, no, no. Oh, it's time for another event. Well, I woke up on day 40, and I wasn't bathed in radiation, so that's good. I'm sure whatever the new event is, I'll find out soon enough, though, and it'll make me cry. But for now, I just keep building. I hear a storm outside, I get up to the surface, and I see rain, but no storm. So I head up, 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 and there it is. Okay, okay, yep, I found it. The rain is acid. That's cool. My solar protection, tough alloy armor, and Rataway still can't protect me. I'm just gonna have to always avoid the rain at all times from now on. Okay, now I know that the rain being acid is pretty bad, and we don't have any way to stop that. But honestly, down here, I'm safe. And it only rains so often. So this is a pretty good chance to get working on the bunker. I'm trying to look on the bright side here, guys. Speaking of bright side, we have two more RTGs. And now the power problems should be much, much easier to work with. For a minute there, I was really worried that I might have to resort to building a full-blown reactor. And I decide that now that the rain has stopped, I do want to go outside and see if there's any more tricks waiting for me. I safely walk over to the marble mine and fill my inventory for an entire day. Then, on day 44, I get the ceiling over the third and fourth farms set up. And I even decide to put some ceiling over the sugarcane. Why stop there? I spend the rest of day 44 opening up this side of the bunker. Day 45, and we get all of our alloy armor enchanted. Although, this kind of backfires on us, but you'll see that later. For now, I'm more focused on the bunker walls. Finally, by day 46, we have the next project almost done. This one is a big one. We finished the fourth farm, which will help us with this project. And on day 47, the industry is humming right along. I just want to be totally 100% straightforward. Nuclear Craft isn't really a mod for everyone. And some of you younger players might not like how grindy it is, but I love it. When you finally get to those big endgame projects, it does feel so rewarding. And speaking of big projects, we just need to add a little bit of water here. And look at this, our own underground indoor river. Now, why would I make this? Well, first of all, because it's awesome, but also it does have a practical function. We're gonna fill it up with Pam's Harvestcraft water traps, and we can use them to get some fish passively while we're working on other things. Each trap just needs a little bit of bait, which you get from one fish and three string. We can then continue the process by using the things we've caught and turn them into bait. Some of the things, however, that are caught uh, can't be turned into bait, like the octopus. But pretty much every single fish that you get can be turned into four fish bait. This is why the string farms are so important. This jute and the cotton will make string for the fish traps. And if we keep using the fish to make more bait, it's basically an infinite AFK fishing farm. And why would we need this? Well, patience. You'll see. Up oh, and here's the radiation. Oh, oh my! Oh, that's a lot. A hundred plus millirads. No way. Okay, I I always knew it would come to this. I just wish I was a little bit more prepared. If I'm exposed to this much radiation, I will burn through all of my rat away well before we get to 100 days for sure. So I need to protect myself using radiation shielding. Now there's three levels of radiation shielding, with heavy taking some of the most advanced materials. But with this kind of radiation, heavy is our only option. But 
One of those advanced materials is beryllium. We have no way of getting it. We need to build a rock crusher. And it looks like we have a total of 33 right away, but I'm using like 10 a day just to stay alive. But I have a plan. If a day passes a nuclear craft, the radiation decays away by a half, according to its half-life. So if I sleep really fast, nope, still full rads. I'm just gonna have to face this head on, I guess. Okay, copper solenoid, electric motor, and we need two pistons. Why does this machine have to be so complex? We just need a few ingots of ferroboron. This is the worst. It takes so much mental clarity to figure out what's coming next and how to set everything up. But this radiation counter makes it feel like defusing a bomb. Both linear actuators are done. And that means rock crusher. Okay, good. I run out and I find some amistite in the caves pretty quickly and run it back to the rock crusher. We have all the medium panels done and I'm ready to upgrade with the DU panels. We just need to get that beryllium to run through. I grab my first little bit. I run it over to a furnace so we can turn it into ingots. Oh boy, only 27 rad away left, okay. We have four. Oh, that's enough for at least one piece of heavy shielding. So now I try to add it to the tough alloy, but it doesn't work. I didn't know this, but it turns out if you enchant your alloy armor, then it can't be fitted with radiation protection. I need to make a whole fresh set of armor. And of course, to combine the two armors takes like 22 levels. So I have to choose between better armor or radiation protection, but at this point, it's honestly no choice. Now, with this heavy radiation shielding on my chest plate finally equipped, the radiation exposure drops to only five millirads per tick. We've made it through yet another crisis. That being said, I know another radiation spike is on its way, and this time, I want to be ready. So I'm going to get two more panels of heavy shielding, and I want to add them to my pants and to my helmet. I don't have enough decayed uranium for boots just yet. But when I finally do equip my pants and my helmet, the radiation goes all the way down. It started at 100 millirads, and now it's all the way down to one. If you plan on trying this mod pack out, just remember, get radiation shielding. It's the best. For now, the old armor is just gonna be sitting in this chest. Okay, so the bad news is now, if I take off this armor, or it breaks, I'm dead. But the good news is, I was smart enough and I planned ahead to have this industry pretty much set up to fix that problem. Minus the rock crusher, but we don't have to talk about that. So I'm going to focus on getting slimes, which I can get by collecting raw jellyfish from those fish traps. This is the real reason we made the indoor river and the water traps in the first place. Thanks to Pam's Harvest Craft, we basically have ourselves an auto slime farm. On day 53, over halfway through the 100 day challenge, I finally decide I'm not sleeping in a cave and I move my bed into the bedroom. I had another bed so people will think I have a Minecraft girlfriend. I mean, I, I definitely do have a Minecraft girlfriend and, and she sleeps in this bed right next to me. She goes to another server, you guys don't know her. I then had some small decorations, focusing on making this place look like a clean underground vault. I get some pot, not that kind of pot, and now I need to fill this pot with weed. I get some redstone lamps, and things are starting to look okay for a hardcore playthrough. We get some leather, and yes, you can turn rotten flesh into leather in a manufactory. It's pretty cool. I then use the leather to get some wall frames, and in those frames, I decide to put some hard carbon and tough alloys. That night, with my radiation protection, it's safe to head out. And to find myself those weeds, I've been jonesing for. I grab a few flowers that look good, and some flowers that will be useful down the road. But yes, I do in fact get caught out again. This time, I have no solar protection, so I quickly need to find a way. I try to stay in water as much as I can, and move quickly with the T speed boost. But the storms have ripped up so many trees, I don't really have much cover out in the wasteland. Once again, I use this trusty tree out front. It's really the only one that's left. And this time, I think I'll wait till I have full health before I make my next run. Ouch! Spicy. But hey, when I get home, we have our flowers set up, so worth it. Best part of the whole build right here. 
I then see I have this discolored block of uranium. It means it's decayed, and I can make DU panels for the last little bit of heavy radiation shielding. But the rads are so low that I'm not really in a hurry to use it. Day 55, and I now decide to work on the far wall of the bunker and push it out just a little bit. Then I set it all up with some marble. It's really starting to look like an underground laboratory, like the institution from Fallout. I'm really glad to see that my vision is coming along so well. I even put down some more marble on the floors to complete the full look. Day 56, and after seeing this unused fourth farm, I decided it's time to make some more cotton. After all, I'm going to need as much as I can for the fish farm, also to rebuild all my solar protection. Now, looking around, the whole bunker is full of life. I spent most of the day trying to get the fish farms all worked out and get as much slime as I could. The reason I'm doing this is, well, you'll see. I didn't know what the next event was going to be, so I wanted to restock my rat away. I only had about 25, and I wanted to make sure I had some more coming, in case anything wild happens. But with all that taken care of, I decide it was time to get some mining done. And I started headed out past... Whoa. Look at that lag spike. Huh. That was weird. Huh, wait. Did I just get a mini little roll back there? This is some serious lag. And I've been totally fine right up until this point, and this is a big issue. Alright, I'm gonna restart my client. That usually fixes these mod pack hiccups. And... Uh, huh. Did it just do it again? Yeah, look. I got set back like five blocks. Okay, I look and I'm on Y12 and... Uh, hello? Did I just clip through the floor? I'm like inside the ground halfway now. And look! I'm at Y14 now. Yeah, the ground rose up two blocks underneath me. Look at this. The tunnel back is even messed up now too. And... And... Dude... This whole corner of my base is shifted. No way! I've never seen anything like this. It looks like the game loaded two chunks wrong or something. This legit looks like an earthquake split the ground in half. Like one of the plate tectonics rose up right along this fault line here. I mean, the good news is it didn't really do too much damage. This is a small corner of the base, and I only lost like one or two water traps and some of the loot and some sugarcane. I think I could do some quick repairs here, and I really just hope that my client's okay. I don't want the game to glitch anymore. Day 58, and I managed to get everything looking pretty normal again. The water's all level, and I've only lost a few of the water traps, so I'll have to get those back soon. It just looks, like, kind of funky. Like, the whole corner of the ceiling is cracked open. I think I'm going to leave it like this, though. It looks kind of cool. So I then head back down into that same mine to see if I can see anything weird happening. And sure enough, it's all just kind of like not normal. And then I see these diamonds all the way up at Y21. Now I know something weird's happening. That's not possible in vanilla Minecraft 1.12. I head to bed, but then I get an idea. I head out of the base because I start thinking. If the ground has risen up like 10 blocks down underground, could there be a chunk of ground that's just, like, bumped up 10 blocks outside? Like, could we... What? No. This can't be real. A massive volcano has shot up out of nowhere right outside of my base. This is one of the biggest naturally occurring things I've ever seen in Minecraft. It's legit about the size of four full biomes, and it has completely upturned the world around it. And the river that ran out front of my base has been turned into a waterfall running down the side. I'm only about halfway up one of the sides, and I'm already towering over the skyscrapers of the city. I'm at Y140. Finally, at the end of the day, I make it to the top, and I see, well, take a look.
So I head back down, and I go into my base and turn off my game to see what mod caused this to happen. But when I come back, I see this. Ash and smoke start to shoot far up into the sky. And now the crater is shooting out lava boulders all around. Are those just, are those just like a cool effect, or is that like a real thing? I start to get close to the top, and I can hear explosions. And now, that massive open pit has been filled and is overflowing with lava. It is a full-blown, active, erupting volcano, and it's massive. On some of the sides, I can see lava flowing all the way down, and I can see the base of the swamp has been completely upended. I'm trying to carefully move around the sides of the volcano, but there are more and more projectiles being launched from the crater. I don't know if these are just for show or if these could actually hit me. I get right next to it. I spend like 30 minutes just taking screenshots. Becky and her Instagram pics from Europe, they don't have anything on my pics. Oh, that's cute. You went to Athens for summer? I'm on a volcano, Becky. I am God. But now I can see on the edge of my render distance, a fire is burning right next to my base. Then I see this. Turns out the boulders of lava are being ejected all over the world, and they are not just for looks. They are causing some kind of damage on the ground wherever they land. As I start to descend, I see that the damage is huge, like hundreds of blocks huge. I get to the top of one of the buildings that is still standing, and I can see this. This thing is unbelievable. Turns out the mod pack is the General Disasters mod. I didn't know that General Disasters had anything like this. It makes my skyscraper look like a dirt hut. Even the land around it has been changed massively. Like I've never seen a disaster this powerful in Minecraft. I don't know how safe this is, but at this point, I need to see what the damage looks like. Then, all at once, I see this. The impact craters caused by the volcano left these at least 30 by 30 craters and they've completely changed the makeup of the ground. In the center of each one of these, there's a ball of obsidian. And if you mine the rocks around the obsidian, you can actually find rare resources that shouldn't be at this y-axis. I find things like gold, redstone, and look, even diamonds just sitting on the craters. So it's kind of neat. At the same time, there were explosions everywhere, but I mean, I can't just walk away from this thing. Look at this. This whole playthrough is worth it in just this one picture, honestly. Okay, but yeah, at the same time, there are still explosions, so with all this crazy stuff going on, I still need to keep an eye on my solar protection. So I decide I'm gonna hide for a night. But as soon as it's safe, I pop my head out and I start running. I gotta deal with the zombies and the raining fireballs. And at this point, I kind of got myself into a little bit of danger. This volcano was so cool, and I needed to go out and check it. But at the same time, I would still be pretty upset if I died on day 61. So I am gonna try and work my way home. I keep moving through what is now the coolest mod pack I've ever played. Now on day 62, I moved out further from the impact zone, and I was a bit safer, but also a bit further from home. I did manage to grab some avocados, and that's pretty cool. And from this vantage point, I even get to watch some of the far off explosions taking place. I walked past my old base as I got closer to home, and I gotta say, it's kinda weird that this area made it out untouched, but I didn't really have time to sit here to see if it was gonna get hit. I saw that one of the buildings in my city was obliterated. I realized that my building had taken a hit also. The area just out front had a few craters in it, and the ground floor was completely changed, but at least I didn't build my base up here. The surrounding buildings have been hit too, and as I went up the top of my building, I saw that an obsidian boulder had lodged itself in the side of it. Then I got to the top and took one last look at the insane, also awesome and pretty cool event that happened. Now I know that this video is about an hour in, but if you guys have made it this far, you're gonna get to see the real hype behind this playthrough. Like I said, Day 60 was pretty cool. What could possibly outdo a volcano in the center of our world? So, I finally build my fission controller. And yes, 
This is the centerpiece of a nuclear fission reactor. It's happening. I clear out my trees because I also want to make some guacamole. In the second half of my challenge, I need some space to grow the new trees. Look how tall this tree has grown. I'm trying to make its way to the surface, I guess. So I placed my avocado sapling. Now we wait. The process of building a fission reactor is complex. And it's not just a bunch of components and ingots thrown together in a crafting table. This is a multi-block build that must be planned out, calculated, and carefully engineered. Or, well, let's not worry about what could happen if we mess up. You need a big open space to place the reactor, so my first step is to make a large reactor room that's at least five blocks tall. I head to bed, but on day 64, I start work on the fuel processing machine, the isotope separator. This machine is pivotal to the end game of nuclear craft, as it lets you further enrich your nuclear elements and enables you to make weapons grade nuclear fuel materials and even advanced man-made nuclear elements like plutonium. First, we put our uranium into the separator as we're gonna design our fission reactor around uranium-based fuels. While that runs, I slowly head back to the old marble mine and I just pray that an obsidian boulder doesn't land on top of me while I'm mining. Day 65, then we start to get the reactor room covered. Right now, I'm just doing the floors because I'm not sure if I want to make the room bigger to walk around the reactor yet. The first step in building a nuclear craft reactor is to set up your reactor casing. This is the outer hull of the reactor. Our reactor will be a modest 3x3x3. Three by three by three. Make sure your controller is touching the casing. Next, from the outside in, you should make at least one reactor port. This is where you can hook up your machines, your cable piles, your batteries, or anything else that you want your reactor to power. They aren't too expensive if you're already in the mid game, so I'm gonna make four of them. Oh, looks like we have a Russian spy. I'm gonna take some of our design secrets. Uh, paper in his pocket said he was working on something called the Chernobyl reactor. Eh, never mind. Back to work. I'm gonna put marble on the roof right above the reactor. And notice that I'm not putting blocks in the edges. This version of nuclear craft, you need to leave this area open or it will mess up the controller. Now for the internal reactor parts. First, we have the reactor cell. This is the central component of the reactor. It processes the fuel, creates power, but also creates the most heat. The more reactor cells in your reactor, the more power it will produce. But the more cooling it will need. We also need some graphite rods for the reactor. And those are made of, of course, coal. Our reactor will have four graphite rods or moderator blocks. They're placed vertically in between the upper and lower reactor cells. And in total, we're gonna have eight cells, which makes this a very powerful and a very hot reactor. Because of that, we're gonna need to focus on getting some serious cooling going. Each type of cooler has different levels of cooling and different rules on how it must be placed in order to work. This is the part that takes some planning and I personally took a lot of this design from the nuclear craft creator himself. You can click the link up in the corner or in the description if you wanna see more in depth about this particular design. But suffice to say, the cooler that I'm gonna start with is Lapis. It cools for 120 heat per tick and its placement rules are that it must be placed adjacent to a reactor cell and the reactor casing. So that means we will place them touching the bottom reactor cells and also the walls of the reactor. We're gonna head to the nether because we're gonna be getting glowstone coolers as well. We need four glowstone coolers and they must be touching two moderator blocks, AKA the graphite rods. And by placing them in between the four rods, they will all be following that rule and cooling the graphite. Next, we add the top cooler and we start to seal the outer casing of the reactor. The casing is pretty easy to make and only takes some basic panels, but you can also add some glass and this will make transparent casing. So we get to see inside the reactor, which I think is pretty cool. We set the casing up and we put a port on each side of the reactor and now we're ready to use it. Meanwhile, the isotope separator has gotten us the key element of uranium 235, which is a more enriched, powerful isotope of uranium. We combine the tiny clumps 
into a large clump of uranium-235, and then it's ready to be added to a base of uranium-238 and make a basic and easy to use uranium fuel called LEU-235. This is a weaker fuel that should burn pretty cold and should not overheat our simple reactor. Yet because it's uranium fuel and we have eight cells in our reactor, it should produce a huge amount of power for us. We place the fuel into the reactor and now on day 69, <laughs> things get a little hot and spicy. We barely keep this bad boy from overheating by only 13 heat per tick, but the power output is staggering. For our mid game machines, it's basically limitless power in the palm of my hands. So let's test the true limits of this reactor. I'm placing a machine interface next to the port, which lets me plug in more machines in more access points. But later, I'll show you guys an even better way to do this. For now, let's just see if we can get our machines powered up by this one small reactor. Sure enough, I keep on adding more machines and the power load is barely used. I need to start running the machine for a true test. But for now, we have tamed the atom and solved all of our power problems. I then plug in the isotope separator, which means that the reactor will be powering the machine that makes more fuel for more power. As long as I keep finding a bit of uranium, I can basically keep this thing going for the rest of the playthrough. Now I still have a few machines that are not plugged into the power, but that's because they're holding valuable materials in them, like the Radaway fluid. One of the machines that is full of material is the melter. This has a ton of molten sugar, which I want to keep, so I think of a little plan. I go behind my reactor room, and I dig out a little pool. Then I take all the molten sugar and move it into the sugar pool. Now I've gone from nuclear engineer to Willy Wonka cosplayer. You guys wanna take a dip in the sugar jacuzzi? Next we take the melter, we slap that on the back of the reactor. Then we take the blocks of uranium that were powering the decay generators and start to repurpose them because they're gonna give us much more power as uranium fuel in the isotope separator. But I feel like we missed an event for day 70. Hmm. Okay, now what? Only 10 milla- Oh! Wait! Huh? Uh, okay. If we stand here, this- Whoa! Oh, this is so weird. Okay. So some parts of the base are highly irradiated, but it's not coming from the reactor. And if I go deeper underground, it dips all the way down to 2 milli rad. Okay, here it's 24, and now here it's 58. Is it gonna change? Oh, 367, okay. What about outside? Okay, yeah, it seems like the radiation is pouring in from outside. The farther I go from the opening of the base, the lower the radiation gets. And everywhere in the base, it's pretty much the same thing. I'm still wearing all of my heavy protection and almost 400 millirads is super deadly. I run up the tunnel into the 440 plus millirad and I seal this vault closed. The surface has an unbelievable level of deadly ionizing radiation. And the only thing that kept me alive for a few minutes was the fact that this vault is all the way down at Y11. A ton of the ionized particles got into the base when the door was open, but we might be able to avoid the brunt of the danger if we are careful. The levels were slowly climbing up and up, but now that I sealed the opening, I'm hoping they will start to set where they are now. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm actually content with 50 millirads. Oof. Okay, let's try and calmly assess the situation. The radiation is now much higher than anything I've ever seen, but we also have the best technology and infrastructure that we've ever had as well. We were smart to stockpile a ton of food and a ton of Radaway for just this apocalyptic scale event. And we can move forward if we're careful. We now need to forego any type of combat armor and just focus on our hazmat suits, as that's the only thing that is going to hold back the poisonous air around us. And the hazmat suit, of course, uses a ton of heavy shielding, so even making one piece will be a big task. But we have enough Radaway, I think we can get over the curve. We get our first piece of heavy shielding, and now we just need a bit more Radaway. So I start dumping buckets of Radaway fluid into the infuser. 
Next, while we're waiting for all that to cook up, I'm gonna try to get some distance from the radiation source and head even deeper underground. Iron and lead are two big things that we need for another panel. The good news is, I found an area here that has trace levels of radiation. The bad news is, it also has cave spiders, so I'm not sure which is more annoying. Now on day 73, we come across this place. It's a nuclear craft biome called the Glowing Caves. And it's pretty cool. I find a way back to one of the old ravines I visited before, and I see that the top has been split open by the volcano. And I consider trying to go outside, but I can't really mess around. I'm still kind of in a dangerous spot here. I get back home, get a good amount of rat away, with iron and the lead to make more heavy shielding. The radiation near the entrance is still around 100 millis, but it is getting better. I managed to get a third panel made, and I consider making a chest plate, but instead I make boots, because the boots I'm wearing have no radiation protection at all. The only problem is that boots take black dye, and in order to get black dye, I'm gonna have to make a trip to the surface. I make a new set of solar protection and take all the rat away I've been saving up. The Russian spy begs me not to leave him, but I tell him that no level of radiation could ever decay away our love. Then I head to the surface. I make it to the surface, and of course, the rad levels are crazy, but not as crazy as the damage brought on by the volcano. The area around it is almost unrecognizable. My building is ripped to shreds. I mean, this looks crazy, but I can't sit here and watch it for too long because the rads are still dangerous. I need to hurry, grab the black dye, and I'm coming back, and I see once again how warped and brutalized this impact area truly is. There's so much going on in this world all at once, it's crazy. Finally, I get hazmat boots on, and I must say it makes a notable difference. Day 75, and I'm now much safer, and the radiation levels, though high and dangerous, aren't spiking above 50 milli. I start to go back to working with my reactor. The high levels are not a thing of the past yet. Even though this fuel is pretty safe, when it's depleted, it still becomes highly radioactive waste. And it will start to poison the inside of my bunker if I don't dispose of it properly. So I start to dig a long, deep channel about 400 blocks away from my bunker. I cut through a couple open chambers and consider putting the nuclear waste here, but I decide not to use them, instead making my own little area here where I'll be storing nuclear waste from now on. The second I take the depleted fuel out of my inventory, my rads drop almost half. And this is only basic uranium fuel. I continue to produce the same basic fuel as I know it will be powerful and safe. But in the back of my mind, I know that the waste is going to begin to pile up. So I begin to look into new machines that could deal with this nuclear waste. The fuel reprocessor. Now I don't want to put this thing on my reactor inside my bunker because it will be processing highly radioactive compounds. So I grab the old RTGs and I move the processor to the same site where the waste is. I then run the processor to see if the results will be safer materials for storage. I then see that I've made Neptunium, which is a much safer and, whoa, plutonium, which is, well, uh, well, I can't say it's safer, but there are some extremely powerful fuels that can be made with this repurposed plutonium isotopes, but they're extremely dangerous, and I'm going to leave this for now. More research needed. For the time being, I can now use my fuel and then reprocess the waste into safer Neptunium. Now that I have this new element at my disposal, I start to look into fuels that are made out of Neptunium, which is weaker, but still useful and is much safer than the decaying nuclear waste. And then maybe I could, well, never mind, never mind, forget I said anything. This reprocessing system is good enough as it is. Now I do need to do one more thing to get my Neptunium production going, and that is I need to start using TBU fuel in my reactor. This is a fuel that you get by processing thorium in the isotope separator. So I build a second just for thorium, but I keep coming back to this plutonium. I mean, they're gonna be making a ton of it. The smart thing to do, no, 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 no. Okay, now I have my first disc of TBU fuel. I take the LEU uranium fuel out of the reactor, and I'm pretty sure that this TBU fuel should work just fine in its place. And by day 78, the reactor has used up its last bit of LEU fuel, and it is now ready to begin using the TBU, which is much colder by about 950 heat per tick. But it's also much less power at only about 1120 FR per tick, which is half of the power of the uranium fuel. But that's okay, 
because we're still getting plenty of power. And the waste we'll get will be more useful once it's reprocessed. I'm continuing to produce both types of fuel. But for right now, I'm saving up the LEU, and I'm trying to see what I can get out of the TBU, since it is much safer. I start to load the machines and get some extra work done, like doubling my ore production in the manufactories. On day 79, I start to look into battery production, but this seems a little bit out of my scope at the moment. I've just got my first little bit of depleted TBU, and I want to focus more on getting reprocessed fuels than batteries for the time being. The depleted TBU is hardly radioactive. This is much smarter and safer to deal with. I quickly reprocess it and get the Neptunium I've been looking for. But in the back of my mind, I'm still wondering if we can find a use for all of this plutonium. Day 80, and it's time to go outside. Working with this fuel has got me a bit spun out, and I'm starting to really smell like a true gamer boy. I get some more solar protection, and I head out into the wilds. It's been 20 days. 20 days since the volcano erupted, and I am still dumbfounded every time I see this. It's so cool. The impact zones get more and more alien and broken. But soon, I get far enough away from the impact zone that the world starts to look normal again. I spent all night traveling and see this gorgeous sunrise coming up. Oh, ow. Ouch. Oof, okay, forgot. Uh, yep, forgot all about that part. Also, notice how the radiation level is zero. When you get far enough away from the hazardous area, the radiation does eventually stop. However, as I was walking around, I started to notice that it started to tick up again when I saw this. This is the biome I've been looking for. Now that I have my endgame gear, I decided I wanted to explore a nuclear craft biome called the Wasteland. It's pretty radioactive, and the only thing that grows here is glowing mushrooms, which is good, because I really need these things. Everything around here, including the Fallout City, is just dead, and there's really almost no new growth. I spend all day collecting these growing mushrooms, and I see this thing. Oh, I almost screamed. I didn't know they could jump. Look how fast they are. If they hit you, they irradiate you and poison you at the same time. They're extremely dangerous, and they only spawn here in the wasteland biome. I chug my green tea and run all night trying to get away from these creeps. I finally do come across this path. It was made by the storms, and it should lead me back to my base. So I start following. Soon enough, I find myself back into the impact zone. This whole dangerous, chaotic zone separates me from my base. Even though this is dangerous, I decide to cut through it, because my solar helmet won't last another day. Just as I start to get close to my base, an old enemy comes back to haunt me. The acid rain from day 40 hits me, and I'm pretty out in the open. I hide underground for a full day, hoping that the storm passes, but it keeps raining. Now I have acid rain, radiation, burning sun, oh, and did I mention a volcano? So I decide I've had enough of the outside, and I return to my mole man ways. I begin to tunnel towards the coordinates that I think my base are at. And would you look at that? I popped right inside the stairway down into my own bunker. I didn't even see that coming. I then set all those mushrooms I farmed into the enricher and pull out my depleted TBU fuel, and I make a few discs to keep the reactor going. I then head for the reprocessor. Now I have the enriched Neptunium 236 and the base of 237. So I can make a new Neptunium fuel called LEN 236. So that's that's what I do. I, I do that. So in theory, this Neptunium should be a balance between the power of uranium and the cooler, safer, less radioactive aspects of thorium all rolled into one. I place it in the reactor and... Okay, okay, so we have 1,690 RF per tick, and we're still safely over 400 heat per tick below our melting point. Cool. So now we can use the waste from our old fuels for more, safer fuels. It's pretty good, I guess. But it's still not the limits of our reactor. What if we make some speed upgrades? The materials for these are pretty easy to come across, and you can add them and remove them from any machine to, well, upgrade its speed. Now we can see how fast the manufacturers really are. 
The only thing about the speed upgrades is that they're extremely power inefficient. It takes double the power to use per upgrade. So maybe we might actually find the limits of our fission reactor here. On day 87, I start to use my slime from the water traps and I begin to make some new toys. Those feral ghouls could be a real threat in the end of the playthrough if I don't have some better firepower. I'm starting to cook up the components for a weapon but it's super slime expensive. I think it costs like 36 slimes, but luckily I planned this out and I have been harvesting slimes the entire playthrough. I get almost everything done, but there's still gonna be a few more slimes needed. So I'm just gonna have to be okay with holding up in my bunker till we farm all the last slimes. Luckily, the gunmetal component is super easy to get. It's just copper and tin, and then you put that in a furnace. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't smelting copper and tin give you bronze, not gunmetal? Are modern assault rifles made out of bronze? <laughs> uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Because like I said, it probably won't be ready till around day 90. Day 86, and I'm finally starting to move all of my machines over to the reactor. So now, I have a ton of machines plugged in to one reactor. And they all take a decent chunk of the power. And I have a bunch of speed upgrades. And if I try to use them all, I just don't have enough power. I can't believe I'm saying this, but it seems like we are so far into the end game that a smaller reactor like this one might not be able to give us the power we need. I look from machine to machine and they're all starting to power down. The TBU fuel might be too weak for all these speed upgrades. On day 87, I head down to the mine to clear my head and think, we could really be able to use plutonium. It would be so useful but it could be too dangerous. I grab a ton of iron so I can really start to pump out the speed upgrades. Day 88, and I start to cook up all the iron and store away a ton of coal. I'm starting to get stacks and stacks of tough alloy, and I'm really starting to master nuclear craft. I'm finally ready for the next step. I head back to the reprocessor, and the Neptunium fuel gets me Americunium? Americium? Anyway, I start to look into what fuels we can make out of this new, powerful element. And we just need to run through some Neptunium. This is easy. So I craft up some Neptunium fuel, and I throw it in the reactor. Will Americium be the element we need to meet our power needs? I decide to take all of our radioactive elements and get them into bigger clumps. If I can, then I can go ahead and I can do something that I normally never do. And that's organize. I organize all the elements into vertical lines. There, for everybody who has OCD and freaks out whenever they see my nasty chess, this one's for you. If you look at my radiation bar, you can see that handling all these elements in my inventory might be baking me alive. But hey, at least we'll die a clean, well-organized radioactive crisp. In the middle of the night on day 89, I see, finally, we're gonna conquer plutonium. Not only are we gonna get the strongest fuel we've ever had, HEP241. <laughs> I better get to the reactor quickly. It's so powerful, it has spiked my rads all the way up to 75 millirads. I'm gonna be able to use a full stack of speed upgrades. I think, wait, 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 no, 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 no! so focused on the power output. I was so greedy for squeezing out just a little more efficiency from my reactor. I deserve that. I was so stupid. The problem is, now we have a massive radioactive molten tower of man-made lava inside of my bunker. And I'm not going to be able to clean up this fallout unless I have more power. That means I need another reactor. I broke down the decay generator so much and I'm already using the RTGs on other things, I can't survive without a fission reactor. I've become dependent on one. Even if I can't unturn this page in my history, I can learn from it. I can become better from it and build something safer and smarter in the future. I'm gonna use the same setup that I know works with the lapis and the glowstones, just like I did for my last reactor. 
However, this time I'm gonna add in more coolers to make sure it's even stronger and can hold more heat. I place the bottom cells in the corner and then the lapis next to them, like I did last time. Only now, I add a tin cooler in the center, which needs two lapis coolers on the same axis, which works perfectly here. That heats an extra 120 heat per tick. Next, I get my graphite rod set up, which go on top of the cells like they did last time. Then the next level of cells, and then the lapis, the same pattern as the first. But again, we're gonna add more cooling in the center column. This time with a copper cooler, it's gonna go in the middle of the glowstone because its rule is that it must be touching a glowstone cooler and it'll add a little extra 80 heat per tick. Then we put another tin on the top, finally the lapis, and this adds three more coolers for a total of 320 heat per tick more than the last reactor. In order to cut cost, I'm only gonna add one reactor port this time. But even then, to get that, I need a bit more graphite. So I'm forced to reuse the decay generators again. It's truly humbling. I have to go all the way back to sitting and waiting for just one piece of graphite while using these decay generators. Finally, I get the port finished and I add it to the inner side of the reactor. I finish up the first front casing and just as night falls, I get the side casing done as well. I throw on a lever and I put all of my LEU in. And sure enough, the temperature is much cooler and this reactor should give us plenty of power for a long time. I don't need to push my luck anymore. I start to rebuild some of my more basic machines and replace the ones that are attached to the old reactor. Remember, most of my machines are locked away in the sarcophagus with the molten reactor. So, with that being said, I really only have one purpose, one objective, and that starts with even more radiation shielding. I start to get all of my panels made, and I'm really lucky that I have enough resources outside of the sarcophagus to get this made. I use some rotten flesh, and I start to make some leather. I need that for the shirt. I make a third panel, then I make the leather shirt, and finally, we can get a long-awaited hazmat suit. I put it on, and now I will be able to deal with even the most toxic environments. I could probably even go on Twitter with this bad boy, but again, let's not push our luck. Next, I get some Radex, which temporarily helps protect me even further from radiation. I craft up a bunch of buckets, and then I head deep into the caves until I find that mushroom cave biome again. This is one of the last few places that's gonna be able to handle all this toxic waste. I dig all the way down to bedrock, and then I head back to take on a task that will change me forever. So I pop my Radex, and I begin the process of cleaning away all the liquid corium lava that is covering the old reactor. I fill all my buckets and quickly make my first trip back to the containment site. I then begin to pour the radioactive man-made lava onto the bedrock floor. I then run back to make another trip. I've almost cleaned out a whole side of the reactor and I'm still holding up just fine. I throw some items into the lava just to test to see and sure enough, they burn up right away. I threaten trying to get some corium on the far side of the reactor. <laughs> yeah, so obviously do not touch the corium. It is big ouch. I once again pour out the corium into the containment site and it's almost overflowing, but it should be able to hold the final bit. Now, the reactor is finally clean. And while badly damaged, it can be repaired. I pour out the last bit of corium into the waste dumping containment site and seal it closed with boron plating. I just hope I never have to come back to this place again. Now we can work on the better designed reactor and start to make it compatible with more machines. I do this by making something called a pile. This can be set on a reactor port and functions a lot like electric cables where you can hook machines into it. I then start to cannibalize the old reactor and I take off all the machines. I then turn the piles on. There's a little black border that turns red when it's turned on. Now I should be able to place my machines next to the sides that have the red square and they should get power. Sure enough, everything's working perfectly. And now with the radiation levels in the bunker finally returning to livable levels, this slime can spawn, which is great because I still need a ton more slimes. I start placing all my machines on the pile cables 
And soon I have one big central hub with all of these different machines, all within arm's reach. As I set up the decay generators on the corpse of the old reactor to power the fluid infuser. This will get me my last little bit of Radaway fluid out of it. I check into this chest, which has all the fuels that I lost when I put up the sarcophagus, and I see that I still have one piece of plutonium fuel, but I have never been less interested in an item in Minecraft in my life. Finally, I get the last of the slimes, and I craft up my scar, with a little bit of ammo to go with it. Also, I get 100 round drum magazines, because at this point, why not? And now, if I have some crazy zombie ghoul invasion on day 100, I'll be ready. I still have a couple of key projects I want to finish in the last five days, one of which is getting the reactor room finally finished. I worked for a whole day getting all my marble set up, and now that I know the exact dimensions of my reactors, I can close them off. I make one extra room here, just in case. And then, finally, I do finish the inner wall of the reactor room, making my whole nuclear craft room its own contained area of the bunker. Finally, we get to see the entire bunker, from the reactor room, all the way down the string farms, with the indoor trees, to the underground river with the auto fish traps. A decent bedroom, a full enchantment library, some good storage, and I even have an extra room. Maybe I'll make that my firing range. Now I have one last thing I wanna try and overcome. I wanna see if I really can make a better designed reactor. One that will be able to run more powerful fuels. Now don't panic. I actually have this one under control, I promise. I place in the HEN236 fuel and it does start to overheat, but I now have a better understanding of how to use a fission reactor. So I can quickly stop down the reactor in time to keep it from going critical. So now the reactor will not produce power and instead it just overheats too quickly. So we need to sacrifice the fuel and reset the reactor. That's not a big deal. I can handle that outcome, no problem. Once we reset the reactor, we can put the LEU fuel in and we only lose the fuel that we couldn't use anyway. So if we want to make a reactor designed to use plutonium, we need to be cooler focused, not reactor self-focused. Day 98, and I think I can squeeze in one last project. I'm going to totally redesign this reactor from the ground up, using everything I've learned with the past 100 days of nuclear craft. We get the case set, and now we can work on the coolers first and foremost. One last day, one last reactor. This time, we only have one cell and two graphite rods to make less heat and way more room for coolers. We're gonna start out with water coolers, four to be exact. They need to be placed next to a cell or a moderator, so it's pretty simple to add them in. Next, we're gonna add some quartz coolers, which cool for 90 heat per tick and must be placed next to a moderator block, AKA the graphite. Now, if you're wondering why I'm using these weaker coolers, here's why, the diamond cooler. Each one of these cools for 150 heat per tick, the best we've made, and they need to be touching a water cooler and a quartz cooler. So now you know why I'm using both of those. Finally, we will be adding a tin cooler the exact same way we use them in the newer reactor. We will be using a total of eight diamond coolers for the final design, but we can get some quick diamonds without even digging for these. Remember, the pressurizer turns graphite into diamond. But in the meantime, let's start the design. First, the lapis coolers will touch the cell and the casing. Then, the eight diamond coolers go into the farthest corners. So we need each one of them. So we need to put water coolers here, touching a moderator block to work, and a diamond to make the diamond one work. We then add a quartz cooler on the lower level of the diamond coolers, touching the moderator block to make the quartz work, and then touching the diamond to make the diamond finally start cooling. The diamonds will be touching all the water coolers on the far side and the quartz in the middle. Finally, like I said, the tin coolers go in the middle corners so they're touching the lapis and still on the same axis. And there it is. This reactor is one of the coolest running reactor designs you can possibly make. While it might not get the same power output as a more unstable reactor, it can process more unstable fuels with ease. I see that I'm slowly getting diamonds, but it's getting pretty close to day 100, and this video is getting pretty close to two hours long, so I'm gonna go ahead with what we have so far. I seal up the reactor and get it ready to be tested. We place down the controller, and it comes in at negative 1830 heat per tick. 
At this point, I truly do believe that with only one cell in the reactor, it will be able to handle the plutonium. We place it in, and it reads negative 1130 heat per tick. And now, finally, at the very, very end of this nuclear summer, we've done it. We've conquered plutonium. <laughs>